You're listening to Life of the Record, classic albums told by the people who made them. My name is Dan Nordheim. Little Wings formed in San Luis Obispo, California, in 1998 by Kyle Field. The debut Little Wings album, The Wonder City, was released in 1999. Discover Worlds of Wonder came next that same year, with Wonderoo following in 2002, completing the Wonder Trilogy. Light Green Leaves was also released in 2002 by K Records, with three completely different versions on three different formats. In this episode, Kyle Field looks back on how Light Green Leaves came together. This is The Making of Light Green Leaves. Hi, this is Kyle Field from the group Little Wings, and we're talking about Light Green Leaves from 2002. At that point, it felt quasi-new age, almost quasi-religious, and maybe too positive for early 2000s independent music. I feel like it's aged well, but I think when it came out, it felt a little innocent, or like I heard someone was like, this is like Rafi or something. There's this guy that listens to Ram Dass from the central coast of California with the lavender sweatpants on, like, trying to tell me how awesome it all is. Boom, boom. my voice says make room. Make room. Wave a hand, come back the gloom. When the eight comes creeping up, I spread my arms so wide that soon my best starts to bloom with the breath that I consume. And I grow like grass on a hillside, it's the way I leave my town. It was the first record I made where I knew maybe there was going to be more of an audience for it than I'd ever had before, just because it was my second record for Kay. And this was a record about the fall, about the autumn, but I recorded it in the spring for it to come out in autumn. And so I'd, I hadn't made a record in about a year and a half when I conceived of making light green leaves. I never try to repeat myself, but I feel like I always build on what I've already done. I think I'm always consciously trying to evolve in some sense, but like Fog of War style, probably lose track of it when I'm actually doing it. So with light green leaves, that was in the basement of the house in Portland that I shared with about five or six other people. It was kind of a predominantly music house. There were probably three to four different kind of musical entities that were just single people's bands, you know, but have a band name that were housed under that roof. So between all of us, there was every instrument, not every instrument you could want, but like an organ with the, you know, drum machine on it. So there were the resources there And so I I think if my memory serves correctly, I had borrowed a reel-to-reel eight track for three weeks. So I think I had three weeks to make that record. And I mostly made it by myself and in cahoots with like one other person, for instance, Jonna Bechtolt from Yacht, pre-Yacht, played drums on a few songs. And I would just have him I, I would just have someone come over and but it was usually just me and another person putting different instruments or different layers on different tracks. I just had time to work on it. So definitely like putting three vocals on one song and it all being my voice was was kind of a, a backbone, a spine of that record. To me, the psychological work of people sitting around a studio watching you do overdubs is the hardest thing to do. So if no one's down there at all, I'm hard enough on myself that I want to get something right. But if I'm not using up someone else's time and I'm the one hitting the red button and then walking over there, there's a comfort in that to me. And it's not stressful and it doesn't seem time consuming because you're just present in every moment that you're doing it. And it's exciting because you're actually 
you know you're making a record. It was dark in there at all. It was dark, I must admit. Was it you that I heard call? It was me from yonder pit. Was it what you thought was you? It was me as someone else. I was crying out for you in high and girly swell. Is a gleam you thought was gone beginning to return? When you lay down on the lawn, can't you feel the fire burn? I was collecting songs, you know, to make a new record. And for me, I guess it felt kind of comforting to spread those songs out over a few releases, even though it's hyper indulgent and probably someone um, older than me <laughs> at that time would have thought I was a little full of myself to do something like that. But I think I went kid in a candy store a little bit and made like a collect them all sort of thing where it would be fun to make a different version per format, you know. The cassette essentially was just my handheld tape recorder, the songwriting tapes that I was using to make these songs. And um, the vinyl version was recorded in one night with Phil Alvram and I. I asked Phil if we could record some songs, and then I just kind of played all of the songs that I had. And we were done with it, and he was like, that's a cool record. Like, maybe that's it, you know? Because I think I already had the name that I wanted it to be called Light Green Leaves. And so I think I decided, I don't know why I decided to record a third version of it, but um, I think I wanted to do more overdubs and have more time than one day to work on a record. And so, and a few more songs came. So that's another major difference between the LP version and the, um, and what was the CD version now is kind of become the classic version of that record. My voice says make run, make run. Wave a hand, come back the gloom. When the dark slips in, I spread my arms so wide that I can see the depth of its doom. With the brightness I resume, and I grow green leaves on my branches. It's the way my blossoms bloom. Wasn't I the wind that blew? It was that what you allowed to come wildly rushing through. You became Boom. As a few of these songs came out of just everyday life, which I love when that happens. I have a, a good friend that I'm still friends with, Tim Bloom, from the band Mother Hips. And he's kind of been like a surrogate older musical brother to me for 20 plus years and definitely went further as far as making a living at it than I did before I did. And he used the word boom a lot. Like, what time is it? Boom. And then he'd just show you his watch, you know? Boom was a, an affirmative, just like, instead of saying yes, it's like, are we going, are we going to go get Indian, the Indian food buffet? Are you thinking that? Boom. I think I was just like, I'm going to write a song called Boom. And then I, at the time, I was remembering this, thinking about this record, there was a Levi's commercial for big jeans. And it was like, Levi's big jeans. And the tagline was, make room like make room like make room inside the jeans because they were big and so i stole that from a levi's commercial the make room part and i'm not even sure if i ever saw this commercial because we weren't watching much tv in the early aughts or didn't have tv maybe but just had a tv and a vcr and we just watched the same two mr show vhs tapes that phil elvram's younger brother had taped it's a very Little Wings song, kind of Joseph Campbell-y. There's a quest, the hero's journey. And like a mountain peak so high and stout, I blew my lid and blew my guts about. So I'm tall, I've always been with flashing flood and whipping wind. I live with everything that I can't do without. Boom was kind of more like a Bob Marley song of like keeping hope alive or I will survive sort of thing. How am I going to get out of this one? I keep falling into this pit, but I know I'm not Elliot Smith. Like I'm, I believe there is hope. I can't have no hope at all and just 
sit in that place because I've tried to do that and I kind of wore out that kind of mopey 90s paralysis thing by this point in my life and, and realized it didn't work for me. And that was kind of de rigueur, especially in the late 90s in Portland. And it's weather-based, I truly believe. It's really easy to get depressed and go down a dark hole and then write songs about that and then regurgitate that and stay in that feeling forever and ever. Hear it like a pounce upon a peak, oh, look at what the light did now. Bear it like a bounce upon the beak, oh, look at what the light did now. Land and water and bird or beast, oh, look at what the light did now. Shiny little band or golden fleece, oh, look at what the light did now. Look at what the light did now. It tries to be meaningful and talk about life beginning and ending and that that's another another theme with the record is fall the leaves are dying and um the light that green leaves as well as like light green leaves and as well the color light green leaves and turns to a brown leaf you know and the first line is kind of like the spring hair myth or something like that's how i see it it's not like a human hair it's like a rabbit, hair it like a pounce upon the peak, and then bear it like a bounce upon the beak was autobiographical, and it wasn't bear, like bear the weight. It was that in the fall of 2000, I actually hit a bear in my truck on my way to Portland, driving by myself, like pre-cell phone days. And I was driving really late at night, and it was super scary to hit something like a maybe a juvenile black bear. I don't think it was fully grown, but the way that we collided, it felt like it was running towards the headlights. That's what that line references. And the other lines are just rhymes. <laughs> In my will I went so twisted, look at what the light did now. Taste the taste, I taste till it's tasted. Look at what the light did now. Bought it like a boast, that burly beaming. Look at what the light did now. Got it like a ghost, that girly gleaming. Look at what the light did now. Look at what the light did now. Look at what the light did now. Look at what the light. It's rather actually steely Danish, almost like Dr. Wu, which I didn't realize at the time, but I'm not super unique or original. I think I'm a sponge that thinks I invent things, but I'm just kind of recycling things that I'm gathering. And I think the title came, sometimes I just like to write, even though I'm not writing a song. And so I'll just write to write and those become pages in my notebooks just full of words, which are kind of just musings or free writing or whatever, however you want to label it. If a piece of music comes, which I think is the case with Look at What the Light Did Now, I think that the chords came by sitting down and playing on the guitar and coming up with something that I felt that felt new to me. I think sometimes in those cases I will flip through and look through those big bodies of words. And I'm 99% sure that there was a page on it in the notebook. And somewhere in that body of words, there was supposed to blah, 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 look at what the light did now. And I think I, I just took that out of context and wrote it at the top of a different page. Like a dead tree that's dry and leaving, look at what the light did now. Play it on me with grief and grieving, look at what the light did now. I would finally fall to pieces, look at what the light did now. We'll meet soon as nephews, nieces, look at what the light did now. Oh, look at what the light did now. Look at what the light did now. Look at what the light did now. I 
I knew it was a special song just because it was fun to play and sing. Some songs feel like you're walking uphill the whole time in a way, and they don't get played very much because of that. And sometimes those don't even get recorded. But um, I don't know why it's universal. Maybe the repetition that that phrase gets repeated so much, and it's a fun phrase to say, and maybe it's about observing. And that seems wise to some people, I guess, is to kind of sit back and watch, or maybe it's a command to do that. This is a note to self-situation A microphone test or a dense dictation The last time they tried to fit me in a funny suit This time they tried to fill my pocket full of loot Next time they'll start to weep while I'm bailing Next time I'll have to wade through their wailing Last time they had to hang me like a poster This time they rode me like a roller coaster Next time they'll have to find me if they wanna try Next time they'll have a long time to wonder why I remember we were sitting, we being probably Greg Olin and I, I can't remember if anyone else was out there, but we were on the front porch and that definitely came out of him and I goofing around and doing like a polka next then. I, I can't exactly remember who came up with it first, but I kind of think he might have, and I don't know why, but I was like, oh, that, that's, that's funny. I'm going to write that. Like I'm gonna I'm gonna go write that right now and I and it was just kind of a repetitive rhyme scheme that was kind of felt infectious. That's what I always like when something starts sliding downhill. You know what the um, pattern is, you know, and then things can start stacking up higher and higher and hopefully get funnier and funnier. Last time, they spread me shallow like the gravel. This time, they struck me twice like a gavel. Order in the court. What court is the question? Give no retort. Leave everybody guessing. Last time, they bent me over like a rainbow. This time, they stepped through me like a tango. Next time, I'll abbreviate it so they won't lose their breath every time they say it. Okay. I would say on the song Next Time, there's you hear a drum machine, and that is from the organ that lived down there. So like, I think I just recorded that first and then played guitars over that. I can't remember what I used for the gavel, but I know for sure one of the things I used was my mouth. When I was in third grade, my friend Arash Mobayan taught me how to put your tongue on the roof of your mouth. It's really weird. It's kind of like gleeking. It's nothing that you might stumble upon on your own. It's almost like someone has to show you that it exists. But um, for anyone who's listening that doesn't know what gleeking is, I have kind of dry mouth from coffee right now, so I can't demonstrate it. But you kind of raise your tongue up. It's odd. It's like a human doing a snake thing, like a spitting cobra thing but you can kind of throw your tongue down and it activates the saliva glands underneath your tongue and you can like kind of shoot some drops of water out kids used to do it in elementary school like gleek on you at recess but um this thing never had a name but it's um the junior version of it was like you know in the front of your mouth but this one you're pulling your tongue up and back towards your throat. I think I might have done that with my mouth and doubled it by like hitting on something too. So I think there might be two sounds like overlapped, maybe hitting on one of those fish that's ribbed. The and I think that that fish is also used on the song Sandbar. I think I bought it at the beginning of Little Wings and it just came with me for a long time. I'll keep a song inside their head and blue. Feed it sweet like fertilize it with some tune. If words are the wrist, then music's the perfume. A oh, song from the mouth of friend or stranger, dangerous bird or bird of danger. If you can peep up well, why won't you? Songs everywhere, so I sing it, don't you? Look at last time for one. If words are the wrist and music's the perfume <laughs> like i think that's probably my favorite but that line has been told to me 
if words are the risk, like K, then music's the perfume. And then I could only assume that that person had never worn perfume in their life. Like what does risk have to do with perfume? With Sandbar, I had a dream that I was in the ocean and on a longboard and knee paddling, but I was kind of like paddling around a whirlpool that was spinning. And it was just kind of this achy longing dream that I really missed the ocean and getting in the ocean frequently. We could go in Portland, but it was, it was quite a drive and you didn't know what the conditions were going to be. So I kind of just wrote about that dream because I saw a younger kid waxing his surfboard and it was about the winter werewolf and looking in the mirror and this and that. And that became the song Sandbar, which on the vinyl version has lyrics. But I was asleep, I was down at the shore. But for the CD version of Light Green Leaves, I decided to turn it into a, just an instrumental because I liked the variety of that and it being able to transform. And the, the album kind of seemed like it wanted an instrumental there. And I based it on the Sandals Endless Summer theme, which has always been one of my favorite songs. And I'm pretty sure it's in the same key and uses a lot of the same chords and even uses a melodica and uses a very similar tempo. And the Endless Summer theme was really important to me. For a long time, we rented that movie on VHS, probably when I was 13 or 14 in Back in the battle, the good old days of VHS, you could rent a VHS machine also at the video store. And so what a lot of people did was you would rent a few movies, rent a VCR player, plug it into yours back home and make duplicates. So we had made a copy of the Endless Summer, which I think one of my younger brothers taped a football game over it years later and I lost it. But that Endless summer theme just sounds like surf adventure or the carefree days of exploration and not exactly knowing where you're going. I think this record for me was sort of about not being from the Pacific Northwest. And I was looking back specifically on the fall of 1999 that I kind of missed and longed for kind of in the way that they say you're never a saint in your own territory from afar. Um, the central coast of California seemed so romantic, like three years ago, this many miles away. The fall of 1999 was also when I turned 28, which by some counts is your Saturn returns, you know, where Saturn was in the same place that it was when you were born. And it's supposed to be a significant kind of um, point on the timeline. Some people believe that where you're at consciousness wise or, or whatnot at the point of your Saturn returns is significant. And I'd kind of moved to the Northwest on some sort of a quest like there's all these independent labels popping up there. There's quiet shows where people actually listen, um, which is whether it was weather and culture based as well. And it, it was kind of hard to get a frequent listening ear at that time in San Luis Obispo 
in the fall of 99 was kind of when I decided that I was going to actually make a go of it making music, try to survive partially in my life as a part-time musician and how, what would that entail. And so I decided to stop paying rent at that time. My friend Tim Bloom that I mentioned earlier didn't live anywhere. He frequently went camping. His band played quite frequently as well. And I was completely inspired when I found out that he didn't pay rent. I made a decision to get rid of, to let go of my room. I didn't even sublet it. I was kind of doing a major shedding of possessions and stuff. It felt a little bit scary when I was moving out of my room. I just trimmed my clothing down to what could fit in like two milk crates. And I was just really paring down. And upon finding out that Tim didn't live anywhere and could get by just living in the back of his truck, I did that while still working at Sandy's Liquor and Deli in San Luis Obispo, which was still one of my favorite jobs I've ever had. And I would say a few nights a week, I would just park in the parking lot of Sandy's and um, sleep back there. I would also sometimes get off work at 11 and drive up to Big Sur for the night, which was like an hour and a half drive. In that day and age, in like 1999, you could still park on the side of PCH. There was no parking, no sleeping in cars signs like they have now. And so for me, it was kind of breaking free of some sort of culture. I probably thought I was doing my own version of like a Jack Kerouac freedom wig. No, I was cracking. I still felt so free. Like seagulls relaxing Or leaves in the tree That's how I was living My boys were my backing And loyal to me Our chest they were strapping I think actually Fall Flood was another Phil and I collaboration because I think he wrote a song off of Filled with Wonder, maybe? And he had something about Blossoms Unpacking. And I don't think he ever recorded that song. I think he went to Hawaii with his family, his parents or something, and brother, sister. And he was like writing on the plane or writing when he was in Hawaii. And I think he gave me the piece of paper or made a copy of it for me. And we started doing that kind of writing off of each other's songs like hey i made a a what wonder part two or this or that and i think because of the wonder trilogy he made a book called what wonder like question mark and was trying to negate it almost playfully but also like well what's so wonderful about it all and so i think my song now that i'm thinking about it what wonder was an exclamation uh in a response to his book that he had made to be like yes you're right what wonder like what wonder it all is Let the fall flood arrive. let us see with me To me, fall flood isn't a water flood. It's the flooding of the feeling of fall. It's abstract enough that I'm thankful and surprised that I think people know what I'm talking about, but I'm never quite sure. That's probably one of my insecurities about that song. But um, I've always had a superstition. I'm a fall birthday. I'm born in November, and I'm a little bit superstitious that my most creative season is fall because it's around my birthday and that's when I'm inspired and summer's over and the weather hopefully cools down and, you know, your brain turns a little bit more inward. So just kind of the romance and the nostalgia for the feeling, I guess that song maybe attempts to talk about that transition from summer into fall. Maybe there's a nesting urge towards the end of the song of like, but where's my person or where's, who am I going to spend the winter with? And then there's a pause in the song and then it's like, pow.
pow, like there they are. Or like, hope, hopefully I get this epiphany moment, like right at the end of fall, like right before it all shuts down for three months of the winter. So soon it came surging. I knew it by name. And so I was urging its flicker, its flame. When the glow came, the lights were converging. They all seemed the same. The moment was merging. So I felt the change, the width of the rain. This would have been the second album that I made where there were duets with someone that I was in a relationship with, actually who was also not necessarily a musician or a recording artist or considered themselves a singer beyond singing along probably by themselves in their car or in their house. I don't know. I, I like the uniqueness of people singing who don't often sing. To me, it's more interesting than someone who proudly considers themselves a singer and then kind of like perfectly hits all these notes and there's no mistakes at all where it feels more like a victim of plastic surgery. Like green leaves from the trees Traffic breeze And it seems The title track, I think that was written after I had the title for the album, almost just like a television show theme almost for the record. That was all about coming from Morrow Bay back into San Luis Obispo and how I always felt kind of refreshed and kind of like the old man from the mountain coming back down into town, like for a few luxuries of town, like it felt old fashioned in a nice way. When I was living out of my truck, occasionally I would decorate under the windshield wipers with some green sycamore leaves and then drive around and see how many of them could stay on. And um, the cover of the LP, I definitely took that photo on like an Olympus point and shoot camera just through the windshield of my truck in the fall of 1999. I thought she did a great job at it. I think I can be a little bit emphatic or insistent, especially with recording. I'm not proud of it, but I think I can be a little bit pushy or bossy. Like, let's just do it. Okay, that was perfect. Now do another one. And they're like, wait, what? Like, I've got to jump off the diving board again. Yeah, we're jumping off the diving board. You knew that's what we were doing. Like, let's do it. Like, I'm like that a little bit, even though the end product doesn't sound like that, but it's kind of like Stanley Kubrick, like giving Shelley Duvall a hard time in The Shining to get the desired performance. Maybe a rough example, but yeah, I don't know if she thought it was that fun or neat or cool at the time, but I've been told since that she was happy that she did it. I see you under your Under Your Blanket was sung by Sienna Falk, who also sings duet style with me on the record. I think at that point, maybe the record was opening up to new and exciting possibilities. And it seemed like writing a song for someone else to sing was a good idea. 
and would bring more variety to the record or to the experience of listening to it. And that she was singing it to me was also part of it. And that I was absent from the song. At the time, maybe there was a little bit of melancholy to that song. There are points in relationships where one person maybe starts to think, oh, maybe this isn't forever, you know? And whether that feeling spreads to the other person by proxy, where they're like, "Uh uh-oh, this person doesn't think it's forever, or if it just spreads because... Like, oh, they've changed. Maybe this isn't forever. I'm just feeling that myself. There's a past tenseness in that song, which was maybe written about that feeling that eventually maybe I knew we were going to let this go. Kind of like leaves dying, you know? And that might have been a coping mechanism within that relationship to have her sing that for me. That you wore the night that we were lovers Till up in the end, feet of blood Till the night was gone I stayed until the dawn I don't really believe in the idea of perfection in a way because with my own music i like something to sound natural for lack of a better word or even kind of casual nowadays that's dying out probably more than ever where you can fix nip and tuck and do plastic surgery on on everything but there is something to a slight imperfection and wobble that makes it sound very human and um, most of this record is very close to first take so That was kind of the way I was making it and the way I was kneading the clay. It was like hit record and go. What I kind of like about the limitations of something like an eight track recorder where you don't have just an unlimited amount of tracks that you can use, I feel like those limitations force a certain level of creativity and it kind of reigns in ambition in some way. And, um, I think that those limitations can be really helpful for just helping a thing to get made because you you run out of options at one point. You're not going to throw on that third shaker and you just have to work with what you've got, which is eight things. The group choir, the brute choir, that would have come out of all one night where it was kind of at the end of the record. And let's get, you know, I think it was six people down there or eight people. And maybe I had enough tracks to do two tracks of them. And so some voices like some bells needing their noises making their mouth going to the day and night well three is my lucky number my favorite number and so i like that that song title is also roman numeral three and it's also i i i that song was inspired by Carl Blau's younger brother, Eddie Blau, who I was fascinated by the Blau brothers, and they were living in Anacortes or around Anacortes at the time. And I remember I saw Eddie play this song. I just remember thinking he was almost like Trey Anastasio from Fish, but like on a local level version, and that also maybe he wasn't into Fish. And that maybe I liked him more than Trey Anastasio seeing him live. But it it felt like seeing kind of a unique kind of jammy free musician in the wild that had no ambition of playing anywhere outside of his city limits and was happy to play at the Brown Lantern Tavern in Anacortes. And um, he just kind of had this wild song that seemed like it came out of nowhere. And I, I, I 
has to have borrowed at least two chords from that song. And the chorus, I, 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 go on to the day and I, 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 to me, I hear it like, I, I, I go unto the day and die as if every day we're living, we're getting closer to death. And it's also maybe a reference to kind of Rastafarianism, how they say I and I, like we're both the I. It's a unity thing. On the sandy shoreline, the moon is full, so feel it pulling, yeah, feel the pull. same time i was thinking about the dustin hoffman movie little big man where he goes through all these different phases in his life his gunslinger phase his native american phase where he pretends he's native and gets adopted by a tribe and one of his famous quotes from that movie is to his native american grandfather grandfather today is a good day to die so it's just another anthem like a twig and branch and bark anthem, which is kind of the theme of light green leaves is kind of like bend like the willow, be tree like, go unto the day and die, like fearlessness, I guess. And um, it definitely is like casting some nature spells, sandy shorelines, the moon is full, feel it pulling, which was also a reference to probably a Phil Elvrum song, like feeling the pull of gravity in scattered showers and whipping winds it will come knocking so let it in kind of open to the way to the Tao probably as well and um just the uplifting feeling of embracing oneness with it all that grand old sentiment that can be really helpful and useful sometimes especially if you're feeling some sort of isolation or inferiority or struggle to just step on that foot and kind of look at the interconnectedness of it all and the general fabric. So yeah, it's like a chant, self-empowering chant, I, 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 go into the day and die, I, I. And it's like a palindrome almost because of the I, I, I bookends, I guess. I believe that was Rob Keysweater's keyboard, but I could be wrong. It might have been Greg Olin's. It certainly wasn't mine. And I would just punch around until I found a sound that I liked. I almost felt like it had a, like an 80s Don Henley sound that seemed like an interesting juxtaposition and maybe a nod or reference to like Boys of Summer or something. Yeah, and I used that keyboard on... The song called Fall Sweep, which is like the Shredder Part 3. What I think of Fall Sweep as, within the context of that song, is us sweeping out this irrigation ditch that was on a property on the Central Coast. And I think the keyboard intro, maybe being in the Pacific Northwest, was a slight nod to the Twin Peaks theme, perhaps. Kind of collaging those two elements together, talking about something so far away, but maybe giving it a Northwest intro. Shredder when 
used to hang at the park in the late afternoon. I'm pretty sure I wrote that song. I think that one is one of the songs that came later after the first version of the record. And I kind of thought it would be cool to have another Shredder song that didn't have to say as much. And it was just kind of like, oh, we've mentioned this character on the last two records. And for them to pop up within this context would maybe feel like it, it tied it all together even though um, supposedly this was a new theme, you know? When I was 12, when wide skateboards came out, which they had come out years before that, but we, we didn't have them yet, I had a skateboard called the Vision Shredder. Vision was the company, and it was Shredder 10-inch on the bottom with checkers, and it's kind of very 80s, like 1984, 85 thing. And it was stolen from my garage because we left the garage door open and I, I'm sure I got a new one, but that was kind of like my Betsy. That was like my first one. And I, it was just that first ding hurts the worst. So that's kind of where the namesake came from was that skateboard. It's kind of like a song that talks about the generation just above you who are like your mentors, your heroes, your idols, and also maybe your bullies. Or like someone you're actually you're in awe of but also afraid of you know and so that's probably about age two because from the younger perspective you're thinking oh this this older guy in the black hooded sweatshirt's got it all figured out but who knows if he feels lost too so i think it's kind of seeing both perspectives on that at the same time and um i might feel better if i knew the shredder felt old in the other shredder songs it kind of attempts to talk about the vulnerability of the shredder. But I think that the ultimate theme is that the shredder is an everyman. And to someone, someone is the shredder. Like someone thinks of you as the shredder. Who's like, it's all a pecking order. It's all an unbroken chain, you know? So like even the lowliest seeming person could be thought of as a hero depending on someone else's circumstance. And what kind of turn would I now need to learn to keep up when I'm feeling so slowed down? I might feel better if I knew the shredder felt old. But I see the sunset on the lump that I get in my throat when I try to tell. The story, it grows like a parking lot goes on the ground. Yeah, like the closing credits on that topic, maybe. Which, if we're really going to push it, maybe it was kind of like the end of that first of my original California chapter and kind of coming to terms with that. And if the shredder's still shredding, I feel like forgetting. I ate his dust long ago He may remember But somehow I doubt that he knows We stayed out so late last night Uh oh, it's morning time again Drank some drinks and fought a fight Uh oh, it's morning time again Will Oldham, a.k.a. Bonnie Prince Billy, was coming through on tour for the whole West Coast. And I had met him a few years earlier, and we were in touch here and there. And he had asked me if I knew of a keyboard player on the West Coast that would want to go on tour with him. And Rob Keysweater was living in that house in Portland. And I asked Rob if he would want to play keyboards with Will, and he wanted to. And so he ended up going on a three-week tour, I guess I got to open up one of those shows in Olympia. And so Phil was helping book some of those shows because he didn't like the venues that the booking agent had picked out and he was trying to make it more all ages friendly or something for the region. So I guess he had Will Oldham shows on the brain and he wrote me an email. And I think the title of the email was, uh-oh, it's morning time again. And he said, Kyle, I had a dream last night. You were in an Anacortis and so was Will. We had a show and then 
you and Will and a few people went out and got drunk. And then I walked outside and you guys were like by a fountain, like a public fountain, like laying in the fountain and singing a song called, Uh Oh, It's Morning Time Again. And so I wrote the song based on that email. My bloody buddy, now I'm spent. The money from my wallet went. The sun comes up to find us in our sin. Uh oh, it's morning time again. Uh oh, it's morning time. Uh oh. The sundial rocks at six o'clock Uh oh, it's morning time again The cock it crows, the sky it glows Uh oh, it's morning time again A few songs came because I had that three week window of making the record So it's almost like you turn the key and you activate this record So then it's just acting like a net and capturing songs until the window closes again and so that was a good example of how if i hadn't been making a record at that point that song would have just gone on the next record but it was pretty exciting to be making a record almost like you're making a soup and someone hands you something you're like well obviously this goes in this soup it's not for the next soup like we're making a soup now so i still try to let that happen kind of like a spell has been cast and chanted and until you're done making the record anything can happen or fall into the pot you know and uh i actually remember going to the club it was called the blackbird in portland and i just to see rob and will and aram and paul while they were on their tour and i was in the green room but i didn't stay for their show because I had to get up early because I was mixing light green leaves the next morning at like 8 a.m. I said, I would stay for the show, but I'm going to go to bed early because I want to be fresh for tomorrow. And, and Will said, I understand. I'll put your face on, get to working. Packs are packing, jerks are jerking. Half the day is gone, where have you been? Uh-oh, it's morning time again. Uh-oh, it's morning time. Uh-oh, it's morning time. Uh-oh, it's morning time. If you're going to talk about the light side, I think with yin yang and such and such, I think it's almost necessary. Otherwise, you're not fighting against the other thing by trying to focus on the light. And it's interesting to talk about the dark forces of nature and the universe. There's like a lot that you could dwell on there, but I, I think... I like not ignoring one side or the other, but trying to talk about them both in the same in the same instance. The way I do, it's more self-help stuff and admitting one's own darkness or admitting fault or flaw behind the door I'm waiting under the curtain my shoe. Like, I'm also the villain in this whole picture, which maybe is actually a comforting place to get to if you're trying to get better, is to admit how bad you actually can be. And that I'm evil incarnate too. I, I wish other people harm sometimes, but maybe that's a step in um, progress. The beginning of just kind of admitting flaw. The gloom crept up from all around. With waving hands, I batted it down. Once I see it, there's no stopping. I cry and shake. My fists are knocking at every door and rattle my key. I would for it any old age I kick and cry and ream and rage oh, Behind doors I'm waiting Under the curtains my shoe My reflection celebrating All of the damage that it came to The way I do is a sequel to the way I do From the first record, The Wonder City but I spelled it French. And the song that's the second part of it, which almost seems like it could be a song called The Gloom, it almost seems like two different songs. I think there's like a chord progression change and then, then there's a new set of lyrics. And I think those were side by side in a notebook and kind of got married in the studio when I recorded them the first time because Phil was just rolling and I was kind of almost just demoing these songs and... There's a chance I didn't have chords or music for those songs yet at that point, and they became cemented in that first version that I recorded with Phil. The way I do is dark and the way I do is hark and only the way of anything that's living. Oh, 
only way I do what I feel fitting I thought it was for my love Hands on your chest move around like dark dust I thought it was for my heart Icicle dies in a gold white snow park I thought it was for anyone Mouth of my mouth with a new wet warm tongue I thought it was for anything to put the shine back on the jewel in the ring Mouth on my mouth with a new wet warm tongue did not go over that well at the time in the relationship that I was was in because it sounds like maybe the next person <laughs> or next people or something outside of the current situation. What wonder. Fight the day, don't blame the way, don't kill your laughing. Fall on me like suns will shine. I think it felt fun to to like use wonder yet again, even though I had just made three albums with the word wonder in them. I think I mentioned before that it was kind of in response to a book by the same title that Phil made at the time called What Wonder. And the reggae aspect of it probably just as much musically, it's kind of faux reggae, but uplifting themes, trying to push forward and uh, not be overwhelmed by just the struggle of human existence. Like these are all just those hopeful mantras that we were talking about that people actually could misread into believing that this is how this person's brain works at all times, you know, which isn't the case, but it's the goal not the norm, I guess. The problem is I, I wasn't trying to create a persona. It's like the person is kind of the messenger of the music or the carrier of the music. And you can exist in song joyfully that way. But I think that trajectory backfired on me at some point, or I felt like someone who only knew me because of the music would be like, well, you're just all about light and you're all about like positive, you know, they could read into it to a fault and um, turn you into some sort of person that probably no no person is. What wonder do you want to see? What party is ailing? One for you and one for me when our faith is failing. What wonder do you hope to find? What party is wailing? Ears are deaf and eyes are blind with fingers brailing. I think I had one reel to make light green leaves and I ran out of tape and I had to eat into the actual master tape from Wonderoo that was still there because it was all happened in the same house. And I had a new song called What Wonder and I was like, shoot, I'm going to have to record over um, Filled With Wonder, which was the first song on Wonderoo. And I put it up and started playing around with the faders. And I listened to the drums and I was like, these drums, oh, that would be funny. Like if I used the same drum track of the first track on Wonderoo, like a bookend. So the last song on Light Green Leaves uses the same drum track from the first song on Wonderoo. So those are the drums that, that was the house that Jack built. Those were the, the drums that Rob played to my if my memory serves correct. And I just recorded over every other track with the new song. It was kind of the hard scrabble times of having $30 in my bank account. <laughs> and like, well, I could save up some money. And my rent was $200, I think. And I read this book, Richard Brodigan's book about Confederate General of Big Sur. And I still smoked cigarettes then. And there's a character in it Lee Mellon or Mellon Lee, I think it's Lee Mellon, and he has his rights of tobacco where he walks from wherever he lives to Gorda in Big Sur on one side of the highway, and he has a paper bag with him, and he collects cigarette butts, and then he walks on the other side of the road and collects cigarette butts. That's when he ran out of money and cigarettes, and then he gets back home and breaks open 
all the butts and makes this pile of tobacco and rolls, you know, can afford rolling papers. And I, I did that once on Hawthorne in Portland when I had less than $20 in my bank account. And it was a Sunday and I couldn't get out even a $20 bill. It was pretty gross. This treasure chest is better best, this booty raking. Piled on our table wide and high. Sniff at the air, run your paws through my hair. Writhing raw and unaware beneath my side. What, 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 what do you want to see? What body is ailing? One for you and one for me When our faith is failing What wonder do you hope to find What pottery is wailing Is your death and eyes are blind With fingers bailing Which was me And I think I copied myself So there's like two of them it's kind of when you're just performing for yourself in headphones. I think it's easier to be funnier when you're your own audience sometimes. And if you're the only audience, then you're not embarrassed to do it in that moment. Because maybe someone else might second guess it. Like, do you want to get that silly on this record? You know, but I think there's something about the privacy of, of that sort of situation where different selves could come out that maybe if someone was sitting there behind the board and there's no way they're going to be as invested in this album as you are and they're like god nowadays they would hit record and then the worst case scenario you'd say that and expect them to be hanging on your every word but you'd look up in the booth and they'd be like scrolling through their phone and it might harm some of the magic of that moment i think the mixing session for that record i think i had in my notebook I had notes for every song. By the time I was ready to mix it, I knew the record pretty well, and I had all the pen assignments written down just in pen on paper. So I just went song by song, and I think we mixed it in like four hours or something like that. I didn't look back. Time as it tells with the casting of its spells. Don't, don't wear off, wear me well, see me shine. By the time the record was out, I went on tour and didn't come back. When those personal relationships feel a little strained or don't seem to be completely working, it doesn't fit in in the context of the community either. So then the community that would be useful isn't as useful as it could be. There were definitely a lot of people there doing similar things that I was doing. But through that, I also realized that it wasn't that important to me personally to surround myself with other artists and other musicians. I didn't feel like it necessarily helped my practice all that much. In fact, maybe made it feel a little bit less special to me or less unique. There's a Henry Miller quote, and he is someone creatively that I've resonated with. He said, humans don't thrive in colonies, ants do. When it came out, I was really happy with the three versions. I felt proud that the material had gotten kind of interpreted in several different ways. My least favorite response to it was reading the Pitchfork review when I had never heard of Pitchfork before then. And I googled Little Wings Light Green Leaves. And then I called up Calvin after reading that. Hello. And then uh, he said... <clears throat> he kind of gave me the Sinatra-esque, any press is good press, which I think maybe his that theory has been disproven by now. And my favorite uh, response from it immediately was that Phil Elverham said, I put it on and blasted it this morning. Like he, maybe he got an advanced copy from K or something. And he was like, it's so good. Like I put it on and like blasted it so loud this morning. I love it. And then some people since then have just been like, oh, my son loves this record, or we played this for our baby when 
when they were in the womb and they still love it or so it's gotten a lot of love that I'm very appreciative of all these years later. Visit lifeoftherecord.com for more information about Little Wings. You'll also find a link to stream or purchase Light Green Leaves. Thanks for listening. 